So, uh, welcome. Let's get started. Um, I already gave this talk at Italian C++ where I received some feedback, so just a quick disclaimer. Um, someone has said he liked the talk and discovered a lot of new features, but somebody else said it's, the features are mostly bad practices, <laughs> and somebody else said they were intentionally horrifying. <laughs> so the, the usefulness of this talk from your, in, in your day job might be a bit limited, but I hope you will have a bit of fun. Uh, I had fun preparing the slides. So let's begin with something easier that you probably know. Um, when you have an array, you can index it. And this is actually defined to be equivalent to array plus offset and then you dereference that. And when you have addition, addition is commutative. So you might as well write that. Well, and then you can also do that because this is defined to be equivalent. <laughs> so you can also write 17 array equals 42 because that is the code above and that is, that's, that's what you want. Now, if you use std array and you index it, this is actually equivalent to calling the dot operator a square bracket. And unfortunately, int doesn't provide an overload, so you can't do that, uh, which means that std array is so much more inferior compared to the traditional array. <laughs> and I recommend that you use the traditional one. Another operator is unary plus. So you have two numbers, you want to align that, and that looks a bit ugly, right? So you can write plus one. And that actually isn't part of the numeric literal syntax. That is a regular operator. Um, this is what the standard does. So the operand of unary plus, it shall be an arithmetic unscoped enumeration or pointer type, and the result is the value of the argument. So it does nothing. However, the type is different. The type happens after integral promotion. So what this means is when you have an unsigned short s and you write plus s, the result will be an int. Because unsigned short is smaller than int, and when you have something smaller than int, integral promotion promotes that to an int. So plus s is an int, because s is smaller than it. If you have an enum, um, you will get the underlying type. So plus a is no longer the enum value, but an int. And if you have an array, an array will first declare to a pointer, and then it will return the argument unchanged. So plus, a, uh, plus array will be a, a pointer to the first element. Finally, a lambda that doesn't capture anything is implicitly convertible to a function pointer. So if you write plus, you will get the function pointer. And there's also quite a bit of funny syntax there. So what are the use cases? Well, you can convert an unscoped enum type to the underlying type, but there's still two underlying for that. You can convert an array to a pointer, but that's implicit. You can convert a lambda to a function pointer. That one's actually useful. So if you have C++11 code, you want to pass a function pointer as a template parameter, you can't directly give it a lambda, you have to write plus lambda. And this will trigger a conversion to a function pointer, and yet, then you can pass that around. However, since C++20, you can just pass the lambda directly, just use an auto template parameter and pass the lambda. So this isn't really useful anymore, except for aligning numbers, of course. Another operator is the comma operator. Now, this is the obligatory example of the comma operator. You have a for loop, and it does two things at the end, plus plus left and minus minus right. And that comma there is the comma operator. Um, all other commas shown in the slide are not the comma operator. They are just argument separators. But the last one is the comma operator. And what does the comma operator do? Well, um, you have two expressions, and the comma operator first evaluates the left expression and then discards its value. And then it evaluates the right expression and returns that. So essentially, you can do two things in one expression and throw away the result of the first one. When is that useful? I don't know. However, since uh, we have got fault expression, this has actually become pretty useful. For example, we've got a pack and a function, and we want to call the function on each element. We can just do a fault over the comma operator. You cannot fold over the semicolon, so you cannot use separate statements for that, but you can fold over the comma operator. And this will invoke the function for each element of the pack in order, because the comma operator first evaluates the left-hand side and then the right-hand side. If you're interested in more fault expression tricks, I've written a blog post, and all links are also at the end. So that's a useful tool. That's, I think, the only actual use of the comma <laughs> operator in uh, C++, except the for loop. So operators can be overloaded. Um, you might want to overload the equals operator um, or comparison. Um, I'm really happy that since C++20, you don't actually need to override not equals, um, because the compiler will just negate the result of equals equals for you. So since C++20, you only need to over overload equals equals and never not equals, which is very convenient. Um, comparison in C++20 is also just spaceship. Um, then you've got the pointer op operators, if you're writing an iterator or something, um, and the arithmetic operators. That's pretty normal. However, you can also overload other things. 
uh, for example, logical AND and logical OR. So if you're custom bool type, you can overload logical AND and logical OR. This works nicely, except that you do not get short circuit. Which means that there's a common guideline that you should never overload uh, AND or OR, because you will lose the short circuit behavior. So regular AND, it will only evaluate the right expression if that is necessary to determine the result. So if the left-hand side is already false and you have false and something, the right-hand side will never be evaluated because it doesn't change the result. But if you overload it, you don't get that. So what's the use for that? Well, I actually saw something um, a couple of weeks ago at the standardization meeting in Varna. So C++26 will hopefully get std SIMD, which is, gives an access to SIMD operations. So we've got a SIMD oh, um, of T, for example, a SIMD of float, which is essentially like an array of floats. And then you can do element-wise operations. For example, you can do an element-wise comparison. And this comparison will return a SIMD mask, which is essentially a SIMD of bool. So if you compare two SIMD values, let's say they contain three values, you will get three bools, one for each result of the comparison. And then the SIMD mask has an overload for the AND operator. So when you have two SIMD masks, you can do an element-wise AND of them. Um, so you can compare your SIMD value and chain that with another condition, and then you will essentially have an array of bools that contain the element-wise result of that operation. And that is pretty useful. And also, the short circuit behavior, you lose that, but you also can't short circuit that anyway, because you're doing multiple in one go, and you have to do everything. So there isn't really anything uh, to short circuit, because just because one is false might mean the other elements might continue on. So the standard library in C++26 will have a valid overload of operator end, which is a nice fun fact. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, okay, okay. So you can, so the result of SIMD mask is not a bool. If you want to get a bool out of it, you, for example, can use any of, which takes a SIMD mask and returns true if any of is bool. And then it would make sense to make short circuit, but the issue is then you have any of A and B, and you can't really like see the short circuit inside the any of, so it's, yeah, but yes, okay, short circuit might be useful in some sense. You can also overload the comma operator. Um, so if you hate your standard library implementation, <laughs> write an iterator that overloads the comma operator. Because the comma operator is used in a wage based for loop, in a for loop, for example. And with this custom comma operator, you, they will be invoked because it will invoke the one on your iterator. And unless the standard library guards against that by casting everything to void inside the comma operator, you will get your own overload and can file a nice bug report that the standard library wasn't supposed to do that. So you can try that out and see how robust your standard library is against that sort of thing. Another operator is that one. So what is that? That is um, when you have a member pointer, you can dereference it using dot star member pointer on the object. But if you have a pointer to the object, you have to use arrow star on the member pointer. And that one can be overloaded. So what, that, what it does by default is you've got a pointer, and then you get a member pointer, and then you essentially apply that to the object, and you get that particular member. Um, so you can overload it. For example, you write a smart pointer. You might want to overload it, so you can use star arrow and get member pointers. But this doesn't compile because the standard library doesn't bother to overload them. Um, if you want to use a member pointer with smart pointers, you have to dereference and then use dot star. You cannot use arrow star. This is an oversight, but I mean, it doesn't matter, right? Like, nobody uses that. However, I found an actual use case for that um, a, a couple of months ago. So in our uh, at Thinkcell, where I work, we have we've got a macro to execute something at scope exit, like a defer statement. And this takes an expression and then creates a guard object that will just invoke the lambda. So it takes the expression, wraps that into a lambda, and it will, will invoke that on scope exit. And then we use that in a macro. And so, for example, we can write, um, we can get a handle to a file, and then on scope exit, we close that handle, uh, which is pretty convenient. However, I don't really like the syntax of that macro. Um, it would be nice if the syntax was something like that, now that looks almost like a language feature. You write scope exit and then you give it a block. And that block of code will be executed when you exit the scope. And so what, what does the macro need to do? Well, we need to create a guard object and we can, so we turn the expression into a lambda. That's pretty easy, just write the lambda capture in front, now it's a lambda. And now we need to somehow turn that into a scope guard object. Well, and we can do that by creating an object of tag type and then calling some operator that takes a lambda and the tag type and returns a scope exit object. And that operator must be an overloadable binary operator with five precedents. And you know where this is going. This is the C++ operator precedents. Look at there, uh, right at four, you've got an overloadable binary operator with five precedents. 
This is the first one, that, uh, so it has the highest precedence of all overloadable binary operators, star IO, and we can use that. I'm going to lift this table up for a moment, um, because there is some information that you will need at the very end, and let's see whether you will. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds. Okay, that should be enough. Um, so we have our scope exit, overload star arrow, and can define the macro like so, and this will give us the nice syntax that we wanted. It is pretty convenient. So that is an actual use case for overloading that operator. Now let's talk about syntax. Else if doesn't actually exist. This is the proof, this is the grammar from the uh, standard. So an if is either an if with an init statement, which is optional, a condition and then a statement, or an if with a statement and an else. There is no else if. But you can write else if. So what I, what's actually happening in this compiles, like this is well as C++? Well, the else in there, the else if there are two separate things. So we've got an else that contains a single statement, which is another if else. So this is equivalent to that. You have an if else, and then the else block is another if else. So a common guideline is that you should always put braces around your control flow statements, even if it's a single statement. But I'm saying your company doesn't do that consistently because you don't write the code on the left, you write else if. Right? Even though that else is a single statement, you should put braces around. But for some reason, we give an else if special treatment, say, and say that else if is something special. But why stop at else if? What about the else switch? It's the exact same thing. It's an else, and then it has a single statement, which is a switch. <laughs> but we don't write code like that for some reason. <laughs> and even though this is the same logic. Right? And that's pretty useful. Like, who needs pattern matching? Right? When you've got the else switch. I mean, we all need pattern matching. <laughs> But the switch is so much fun. Like, this is a switch statement. You've got multiple cases with fall through and everything. Like, this is pretty weird syntax if we think about it. Um, and, like, it gets even weirder. For example, like, the cases can be in any order. And this includes the default case. So you can put the default on front. But it doesn't change anything. It just looks weird. You can also put a statement right at the very top. And this never executed because it doesn't have any label preceding it. But the grammar allows it. You can put it in there and just put like some sort of comment in there. <laughs> you can also, like, there are braces. But if there's only a single statement, you can emit the braces. So you can write something like that. This is a switch statement that contains a single statement, three labels, <laughs> and then this is a separate statement that's executed all the time. <laughs> right? So that is pretty cool. Um, you can also... <laughs> You can also combine the switch statement with other control flow statements. Um, so this is a switch that sort of had a merge conflict with an if else. <laughs> and now we've got an if i is equal zero, but that one's never actually executed because if i is zero, we jump to the case down there and execute that one. <coughs> and this can be all combined to create this beautiful thing. Um, you might have seen this, Duff's device. This is uh, if switch and loops sort of but the same. So you want to copy data around, um, and you want to do loop unrolling. So you want to copy eight bytes at a time. But the issue is, how do you handle the remainder? Right? If it's not divisible by eight, you might need to copy the remaining three bytes. So what they do here is they have a switch over the remainder. And if, let's say, the remainder is two, we jump to two, do two single copies, and now it's divisible by eight. So now we have a loop that just ignores all the cases and just does eight at a time. So this is a very compact way of writing, let's say, some sort of mem copy. Now, all of this can also be combined, like we've combined all of those tricks in our company as well, and the author was pretty proud when he showed me his macro. Um, switch now default. So this is a switch statement that gets an assertion whenever you hit the default case. So the way it works is we've got a regular switch statement and we start with the default case. And then we don't have any braces, and instead we've got an if-else. And the braces of the switch are part of the else. So when we hit a case, we will jump to the case and do the code, like a uh, regular switch. But when nothing hits, we enter the default label, enter the if true, and trigger the assertion failure. <laughs> right? So this is a switch that has does like one-time checking um, on the default case without having to write it. And you get pretty nice syntax, just write switch no default instead of switch, and you get um, that thing. And yeah, that's... Yeah, <laughs> right? I mean, who doesn't like code like that? So.
The standard library has fixed size integers, but they might not be available on all platforms, so it also has least 32 and um, fast 32. Least 32 is the smallest one, that's at least 32 bits, and fast 32 is the fastest one, that's at least 32 bits. Um, they also provide fast versions for floats. We've got float t and double t, and they are defined to be the fastest version that's at least as wide as the underlying type. So you can use that if you want to. Like, if you only want float precision, but you might, you're on a platform where for some reason double is faster, you can use floaty, and this will then be double. It also, the standard library has some pretty weird stuff in, under the section called floating point environment. For example, we've got the rounding mode. Um, so we can say round downwards, which means that we round towards negative infinity. So both negative and positive numbers get smaller. Uh, or we can do round toward positive infinity and always round up, even for negative numbers. So negative 2.3 gets rounded up to negative 2. You can round towards 0, um, which is sort of the default behavior. So then positive values get uh, smaller and negative values get larger. So you go towards 0. Um, or you can round to the actual, so uh, towards 0 is the default when you truncate an integer, to a floating point to an integer. Or you can actually do rounding and this will then round to the actual nearest uh, value. And you can set that, this is global state, you can set that by calling fsetround. And this sets the current um, rounding mode in your program. What does it affect? Well, it affects the rounding functions, uh, not those ones. So those ones always have the specified rounding mode, so floor always runs towards negative infinity, seal always up, and so on. Um, but there is this function called nearby int, and this rounds using the current rounding mode, whatever is the global state. So if you want to round, but you also like global variables, you can use nearby <laughs> int. <laughs> And then you get customizable rounding behavior. Um, if you use that, one thing to note is that when you round 2.5 using std round, what's printed there? So it rounds to the nearest integer. What's the nearest integer of 2.5? I mean, there are two choices, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> no, it's three. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you round uh, your nearby int and you say round to nearest, then that, then that will be true, <laughs> because nearby int and nearest rounding mounts on rounds to the next even one for 2.5. So 2.5 gets rounded down to 2, but 3.5 gets rounded up to, three, uh, up to 4. All others round uh, as before, but round always rounds up, which is, I don't know why there's a difference. Um, I didn't want to know there's a difference, but now you do too. <laughs> There's also a thing called the floating point exceptions. So there are five. Um, divide by zero, uh, as expected. Uh, inexact, this is when you, the result cannot be represented in the floating point. So some rounding had to occur. Um, invalid, for example, if you call the square root of negative one, this will be invalid. Um, there's overflow if the floating point value is too large. And underflow, which is when the floating point value is too close to zero. So it gets turned into zero. Um, actual integer underflow doesn't exist. Even if you have a really small integer that's like smaller than int min, this is still integer overflow. Because underflow is only when you truncate to zero and not when you wrap around on the other end. And this is just a pedantic thing you can annoy your coworkers with. But those aren't actually exceptions. Like there is a function to raise them, but they are not exceptions. They're, this is part of the C library. Um, they're global state that you can call this function to test whether an exception was thrown. So they just send set a flag somewhere, and then you can test whether the flag was set. So you can write code like this. Because it's global state, you first of all have to clear all exceptions, um, because who else, what might be in there. Then you do an operation, and then you can check whether this was a division by zero by testing for that particular flag. And if x was in fact zero, this will print infinity, because one divided by zero is infinity, and then division by zero. So this actually might be useful if you want to figure out exactly what sort of floating point operation meant. Um, what happens when we divide zero by zero? What's the result of that? <laughs> now it's not infinity. One? No. It's also not one. No. It's also not, not a number, it's negative not a number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason for that is that not a number, like everything else, has a sign bit. And for some reason, on Intel CPUs, the sign bit is all, always set. So not a number generated by operations are always negative. So we've got negative. Not a number and negative not a number, but if you look at the bit representation, NANs are identified by that exponent pattern. And we've got all those x's in there, they don't matter. So we've got a bunch of not a numbers. In fact, for 32-bit floats, we got over 16 million different not a number values. 
which is pretty convenient. Um, so the standard library provides a function, NAN, you give it some payload, and it will give you not a number that contains that payload. <laughs> and this is actually useful in a technique called as NAN boxing. So if you're writing, for example, um, a JavaScript interpreter, it needs to either store a floating point number or like a pointer to something else. And on a 64-bit double, can fit a 48-bit pointer in NAN. So it can store everything inside a single floating point value, and it's either an actual number or it's a not a number, and the payload is the address you're pointing to. Um, this black box has more details. So that's a pretty neat trick. Okay. Let's look at syntax again. <laughs> yeah. There, um, you, you, you've seen that. What? So keep in mind what room you're in. Yeah. Uh, we are currently in East Const. And my company also uses EastConst, which is like the one drawback. Um, so if anybody, I'm look, open for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> so you can write const int or int const. You can also write const expr explicit or explicit const expr. I don't see anybody handing out any armbands surrounding that, so maybe we should get on that. Right. Who writes const expr explicit? OK, a couple of people. Who writes explicit const expr? OK, who has no idea? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's the majority. Like we, we should capitalize on that. You can also write unsigned int or int unsigned. And in fact, the grammar just talks about the decal specifier sequence. And the decal specifier is anything like int or unsigned or const or static or type def. And the decal specifier sequence is just those decal specifiers in any order. Which means you can write code like that in type def a. A is a type def for int. You can write that one which is a volatile float that is static and inline, you can write east const expr, right? Int const expr c. I've actually seen that in our code base because it's apparently consistent with int const or something. Um, you can also write that, which is a long, long, because unsigned, I've got two <laughs> longs in there, that local and external. We got just a sequence of decal specifiers. So maybe just sort the declaration specifiers alphabetically. <laughs> So you write auto const, but int con uh, but const int, right? <laughs> Avoid that argument altogether. The other half of a declaration is a declarator. So we've got a sequence of declaration specifiers like this int here, and then we've got multiple declarators. And you can put them in the same line using comma. And again, this isn't the comma operator, this is just a comma. So a, b, two ints. You can for star c, now this is a pointer declarator, which is now a pointer to int, which is also why writing code like that is a bit bad, because b is not a pointer. The pointer is part of the declarator, not of the decal specifiers. So a is a pointer to int, and b is an int. You can also initialize something in there, now d is 42. Um, if you want to call the default constructor, you can do it like so, except, oops, that's a function. <laughs> e is a function that takes no arguments and returns int, and you can just declare it in the same line, as all the other variables you have going on there. And you can even continue and say, OK, f is a function that takes an int. <laughs> so if you have multiple functions that you want to declare in one line, here you go. <laughs> as long as they use like the same decal specifier sequence and the return type. Um, now that is g. What is g? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's something. I, I didn't put it in my speaker notes, and I don't know anymore. But it's something about. <laughs> But it takes a floating, like it's, it returns a function pointer. Uh, it's a function that returns a function pointer. So let's talk about function pointers. Um, this is a variable that is a function pointer. You sort of start in the middle and read from there. So this is a pointer to a function that takes an int and returns an int. Um, this is a function that takes an int and then returns a function pointer that takes an int and returns an int. Uh, this is an array of function pointers. And we've got lambdas. And lambdas without captures are implicitly convertible to a function pointer. So the class, the compiler writes, has an, a conversion operator to a function pointer. Except that's not the correct syntax. That is not how you write a conversion operator to a function pointer. Anybody want to stay, take a stab at how you write a conversion operator to a function pointer? OK, maybe you try something like that. So the name of the function is operator, and then the argument list, and that's in the middle. Um, except that one doesn't compile either. So maybe that, only the braces, uh, the argument list is in the middle and the operator is in front, but that just looks weird. Um, you can try that one. MSVC actually accepts that one for some reason. <laughs> but it's also not correct, um, because 
There's a reason the compiler generates the lambda class, because there is actually no syntax. You cannot write a conversion operator to a function pointer. The grammar doesn't allow it. The only way you can, you can do it is use a type def or something like operator auto, and then have just return the function pointer and have the compiler figure out what the type is. <laughs> Which I feel like there, this is a defect in the language, but like I don't want to propose a syntax for that. Right? Um, <laughs> so we've got declarations. We can put them. We can declare a global function and a global variable, and then we can use them inside our function. But it actually doesn't matter where we put the declaration. We can even put it inside the function. Now, global is still a global variable, and g is still a global function, because the linkage is not the same as like, the visibility of the name. So global has external linkage, which means it's global and has static storage duration. And functions are implicitly external. So this is perfectly valid code. And it's just like, more encapsulated, because other code isn't aware of the global variable. And this also means that people always say, well, static has so many meanings. And this is true in C++, but it is not true in C. In C, static only has one single meaning, which means static storage duration. Because there is no difference between writing like a file local variable like so and writing it inside the function. The only difference is the visibility of the name file local, but that is determined by a different feature. Like static just means this is static storage duration. And even this is because in C, if you initialize a static variable, the initializer has to be a constant expression. So it has to be initialized at compile time. There isn't this lazy initialization that happens with C++. Right? So this is the exact same code. Static means only one thing. There is no difference between the two. Function local statics aren't really a thing. It just means that the declaration isn't visible on the outside, and nobody else gets any way to do that. So static isn't overloaded in C. Only C++ came along and added a mess to it. So it's not C fault. You have a main function. Main function has a try catch. Um, you can also sort of omit the braces and write it like so. Um, this is called a function try block. So int main, and then you sort of nest the try in there. And this one uh, was motivated um, by constructors. So if the member initializer list throws and you want to catch that exception, how do, what do you do? You can't put a try catch on there. Uh, well, you can. You can put a function try catch. So this is, I think, the first feature that has an actual use case um, that you can use if you want to handle an exception. So this is a class. You can also use struct. And the only difference is the visibility, right? In the struct, everything is public by default, and the base classes are public by default, and in a class, it's private. But there are a couple other places where you can use the keyword class. Can you also use struct there? For example, this is an enum class, and this is an enum struct. And they're the exact same thing, right? It's just that the grammar allows both class and struct at that point. As an aside, if you have an enum and you have a switch, and you want to convert everything to a string, um, and it's a scoped enum, you have to like, repeat the name all the time, um, which is a bit annoying. So you can use using enum, and this will bring the name into a scope, and then you don't need to repeat it. And this is an actual use case for the fact that you can put a statement in the switch, in the switch outside of any case labels. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like I'm actually a co-author on the paper that proposed using enum, and the examples always had the using enum outside the switch. And I was like, no, no, we can put that in, in the inside and maybe teach people about that, that you can put it in the inside, because why would you know that? So you can put statements like <coughs> using inside the switch, because they don't, it doesn't matter if they're not executed. They're, this is not why they're there. So we've got a template parameter that takes a type name or a class. And this is identical. What about struct t? Can you also write template struct t? Who thinks you can use template struct t? OK, we've got a very careful Matt and a couple <laughs> other people. And yes, this compiles. Question is, how do you instantiate it? Because this is what you need to do. Foo takes a non-type template parameter of type struct t that doesn't have a name. So when you call it, you have to give it an object. So struct t and class t are something completely different. <laughs> OK, and let's talk about actual features for a bit. Um, so dynamic cast. We've got a base class, and we've got a derived class. And you can use dynamic cast to convert a base pointer to a derived pointer in a checked way. So this is a checked down cast. Like you, you might not have an object in there, so you can use dynamic cast to check whether you're actually doing the correct type. 
You can also do a side cast. Um, so you've got a drive class that has two base pointers, and you've got a base pointer to the one, and you convert that to a base pointer to the other, and this goes down to the derived object and then back up. So this is a side cast. You can also do a set with dynamic cast. And then there are a couple of things, like you can also use dynamic cast to do an upcast, but that's just the same as a static cast. Why would you use dynamic cast? But there's one thing that you cannot use with a static cast, only with dynamic cast, which is a dynamic cast to void star. <laughs> and dynamic cast to void star gives you a void star, which is the address of the mouse derived object. So here we've got derived, has two base class. We've got a pointer to base two, which points like in the middle of the derived object. And then the dynamic cast to void star gives you a void star to the beginning of the base one object, which is also the actual address of the object you're dealing with. And you have to give it a, only give it as a void star, because while the offset is, static, is known dynamically, like the type is dynamic. So you cannot have a dynamic cast, and then it gives you the correct type, because then that means the type will change dynamically. But you can get it at a void star, so to sort of like get the offset. And one use case, for example, you can use an anyref, which is like a pointer to anything. So it stores a void star under type info, and you can initialize it from a reference by just taking the address and using type ID. Or you can have a base class. Uh, type ID still gives you the correct type, but if you want to have the correct address, you need to use dynamic cast to void star to get the true address of the object you're dealing with, and then you can downcast from there. And yeah. So instead of any and this sort of type order, it's often better to use variant, or uh, in this talk, union. So this is an event uh, for some sort of user interface API, so you either have keyboards events or mouse events or a couple others. And the size of this thing is 3UN32. And this is because each keyboard event, like we've got, so keyboard event is 2UN32, and then we've got the UN8 in front, and so then we have padding, so we store 3UN32. And this is annoying because the keyboard event and the mouse event themselves might have enough space to store the kind event directly. But we, of course, cannot store the kind inside them because we need to have it outside the union so we can always access the kind. Right? Except there's a quirk about union access. So when you have a union and you have an active member, you are permitted to read a non-static data member of another union member, provided that we've got this thing that they're part of the common initial sequence. And then the standard says what the common initial sequence is. So essentially, you have two structs. And if they both start with the same member list, so for example, both start with an int. You can access that int through either union member. This means that you can write the event like so. You've got the event kind as one alternative, then the first member of the keyboard event, and then the first member of the mouse event. And now the event enum is part of the common initial sequence of all union variants, so you can just write dot kind regardless of which member is active. And this is completely well-defined code, and we got rid of the padding, because we now use the padding um, inside the struct that was there anyway. So if you're writing a bunch of text unions, you can use this trick to sort of like get a bit of space optimization out of that. Any questions? Because this is bit... Sorry? Uh, yes, yes. If you have a uh, union, like, uh, as long as it's a standard layer type, it happens because if you can have any union, union as first member, or struct as your first member, or any combination. It just has to be standard layout, and they all have to be identical. But yes. Okay, he's planning some evil thing. Um, I'm not responsible for any actions caused by my talk. <laughs> you should have signed a disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> so, you can do some evil things with that. Um, so Louis gave a lightning talk in 2018, as he now. He was dealing with lambdas. And at the time, lambdas, even if they didn't capture anything, they weren't default constructible, which is annoying, because they're empty types. They should have a default constructor. So he came up with a way to legally construct an empty object without a default constructor. Um, link again to the talk is at the end. But essentially, you're using the fact that you have the common initial sequence of a union. So you create one member that can be constructed, and then an empty type is, doesn't take part of the common initial sequence. So you can use that to go through, get a reference to the empty one, and use that happily ever after. So um, the only downside is this isn't const expert because it requires a reinterpret cast at one point, which is also legal. So just check out the talk. It has a bunch of surprisingly legal stuff in there. And while I mentioned union, they can also have private members and member functions, including constructors. So um, just leaving that out there. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? 
The standard library, let's talk about the standard library for a bit. Um, it has a bunch of dynamically sized sequence containers. Vector of t, deck of t, list of t, forward list of t. We've got vector bool, which is technically a different one, just has the same name. And then we've got val array of t. Now, who here has used val array? One person, OK. So val array is what should have been called vector, because it is an actual vector. If you have a val array, you can do member-wise operations similar to SIMD, um, the proposed SIMD type. So for example, you can have a val array position and velocity and then do arithmetic on that. Uh, it also has pretty fancy like slicing operations. Um, so for example, we have an n by n matrix and we want the diagonal, so we use a slice that like starts at zero, then has n entries, but each one is offset by n plus one. So we start at zero, then we go to that one and that one. So we take the diagonal and then we sum it and that way we can compute the trace. So it has a bunch of pretty useful things. Um, it has a wide range of mathematical operations operations, so you can do like uh, the trigonom trigonometric functions are overloaded on them and things like that. It has members.sum and so on. It is implicitly restrict, so the compiler can assume that they don't alias. If you have a pointer to a array and a pointer to another val array, the compiler can assume that they don't alias and do a bunch of optimizations. Um, it is allowed to do expression templates, so if you have a val array like a complex operation, you can use like a fused multiply add operation. Like it's pretty well optimized, but nobody uses it. And like nobody, like there is this myth that they are not good to use, but like nobody uses it, so they don't spend any time optimizing it. And like I don't know why nobody, like there isn't any technical reason why you should use it. It's just that nobody does. If you truly need a dynamic vector operation, you can try Valerie. Like it's there in your standard library. Right? It's just a bit forgotten about. It's a weird C plus plus feature. You might not know. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, a standard library also has exception classes. Um, this is one-time error, and I've shown the full interface of one-time error. And then you can use it like so, so we throw a one-time error, and then we use format to get the format string. So there is something odd about the code, like something unusual, something weird, something doesn't quite fit together. Can anybody see what it is? The code compiles, it's valid, it works, that's not the issue. It's like, yes? Uh, the constructors are not marked now, except uh, yes, that is true because it has to take ownership of, of the string, which requires an allocation. But yes, that's the right direction. The copy constructor is now except. But we are giving it a temporary string, it has to take ownership. How can the copy constructor be now except? The answer for that is one time error is a ref counted string. It internally stores a ref counted string, and the copy operation only increments the ref count. So if you need an immutable ref counted string, <laughs> it's in the standard library. I just propose creating a wrapper because the interface is a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> so the data structures you find in the standard library. So of course, um, exceptions are used for error handling. So if you've got a function, there's an exception. And then we go to the catch block. We go to the catch block. We go to the error case. Except this one doesn't compile because you can only go to within one function. You cannot go to through another function. Well, you cannot go to, you can jump there. So the standard library provides <laughs> set jump and long jump. So essentially, we start in main. We call it set jump to remember the current position where we're at in a global variable. Um, this one returns twice. So the first time it returns, it returns zero. And then we do the actual code, call the operation that we want to do. Inside the operation, we trigger the error, and then we call long jump. And then long jump jumps back to that label and returns the integer we've given it. So then we are back in the first line of main inside the if, return it there again from a second time, this time returning a non-zero value, and then we go to the cleanup. So if you want to use exceptions, but not quite, you can use long jump. It has also the opposite that you don't have to worry about destructors running, because they don't do. <laughs> right? so it's, even faster than exceptions, because you just <laughs> <laughs> jump there directly. And it's actually pretty interesting. So set jump essentially it saves the current registers in the global variable. And then when you long jump, you just restore them. Um, this blog post, again, links at the end, has an implementation um, of that. So if you're interested in that, it's uh, pretty cool. Now this is kind of a theme about safety or whatever, so let's talk about undefined behavior. This is a function that takes two integers and returns the sum. Is there undefined behavior in this function? Maybe. Yes. There is undefined behavior because of integer overflow. What about multiplication? 
as the undefined behavior. Can you trigger undefined behavior in there? Yes. Yes. And in fact, you can trigger it in 99.99993% of all possible input values. <laughs> Because there aren't many integer combinations that don't trigger undefined behavior <laughs> when you multiply them. What about division? Is there undefined behavior? No. Yeah, a division by zero. Yeah. Division by zero is undefined behavior. There's, there wasn't a trick question. Okay. <laughs> um, we are certain that b is not zero. Is there undefined behavior? Yeah. Yeah. Now, maybe, okay. Um, choose complement. We've got positive values that start with a zero and then have a bunch of sign bits, and we've got negative values that start with one and then we have a bunch of bits. What about zero itself? Well, a zero is considered a positive value, which means that we have more negative values than positive ones, because zero takes up one space. So we go down to 128, but up to 127. This means that if we divide int min by negative one, we have an integer overflow because the positive version of int min isn't, doesn't fit in an integer. It's int max plus one. So we can trigger an integer overflow in division, <laughs> which is fun. And it's like only this combination triggers it, like only one value, uh, combination of values triggers an event. What about modulo? Well, modulo, like the result is small, like it's the remainder of the division, so it's smaller than b. So how can we trigger integer overflow in there? Well. If you do int min modulo negative one, you get integer overflow, which is a bit weird because the result is zero. And zero definitely fits in the integer. But the standard says this is undefined behavior. Right here. Um, because if A divided by B is undefined behavior, A modulo B is also undefined behavior. And the standard doesn't do that because it doesn't like you, although maybe, um, I mean, it doesn't know you. But if you look at the assembly code, it's pretty obvious. Like on Intel, there's one instruction that computes both division and modulo. And so naturally, if division already has undefined behavior, the modulo necessarily has the same thing. And on ARM, it's even more obvious because ARM doesn't have modulo. So you do division, and then essentially you compute the remainder. But if you can't do division, right, you cannot compute the modulo. So modulo has undefined behavior. And this gets really fun if you look at it in the debugger, because LLDB says, We've got a floating point exception, integer divided by zero, which absolutely isn't what's going on here. <laughs> so I want to end this talk with my favorite quiz. Um, I posted a couple of years ago on Twitter, um, and I've told you everything you needed to know to understand this quiz. So we've got a short a, size of plus a, string, what, what does this code print? Just think about it for a bit. Don't, don't say anything. Yeah, okay, maybe say something. I don't know. So, <laughs> so we hit, let, let's walk through it. And so we've got a string that will. Um, this is an array of chars. OK, that's straightforward. We've got A. A is a short. Um, unary plus does integer promotion, so with the result will be an int. I told you that in the beginning. Uh, so result is int. Um, size of returns is size t, which is the size of the thing in bytes. Except the standard says that size of a char is one, and otherwise it's implementation event. So even if, like it doesn't actually return the size in bytes, it returns the size in char. And if you have a 64-bit char, size of char will still be one, and your byte is eight bytes, which is weird. But otherwise, the, so we've got an int, and size of an int is implementation event. Uh, but Richard gave us uh, the system, so we're on LP64, and there int, size of int is four. So, the built-in index operator is commutative, so I can write 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the same thing as 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 4, which is 6, so we print 6. And Twitter did a good job, print 6, good job. And just to not rely on Twitter too much, let's actually compile it and see what the result is, and the result is 1. <laughs> <laughs> so, and with, you might not know who Richard Smith is. Um, Richard Smith used to be the editor of the C++ standard. And you know, the saying is nobody really knows C++. Well, Richard Smith is nobody. And <laughs> his quiz has layers to it. And it goes back to the operator precedence table I told you to remember. Uh, size, of. size of is a unary operator that has a lower precedence than array subscript. <laughs> so this code is actually equivalent to that code. 
which means that. So we have size of, of an index operation, and that it doesn't matter what A is or whatever, this is definitely a char, and size of char is defined to be one. <laughs> so the snippet was even completely portable, and the fact that he told us on which platform he's running on was a complete heretic. herring. <laughs> so yeah, that's my favorite C++ question. I've got a bit more time, so I'm going to show you my, the most, a thing I really hate, I want to share that with you. So, what is 10 modulo 7? Three, Three yes, <laughs> good job. <laughs> yeah. What is 10 modulo minus 7? No, I mean, it's still 3. Because 10 divided by 7, minus 7 is negative 1, and then you have a remainder of 3. Right? Minus 10 modulo 7. I don't like, no, that, that's interesting. And so division is defined, like the division formula needs to satisfy that equation. You divide A by B, and then you can reconstruct A using division and modulo, and the absolute value of uh, A modulo B is less than B. Right? That's all the guarantees the standard make. But that's not enough to uniquely identify the sign of A modulo B. And it all depends on how A divided by B is rounded. So there are various ways to round them, and depending on that, you get different results. So you can use truncation, which rounds towards zero. And then the sign of the remainder is the sign of the thing of A, uh, which means that the interval is either zero in zero, uh, zero to A, or in like if A is negative, in A to be zero, and then it's a negative value. You can also round down always towards int min, and then the sign is the same as B, and then the interval, um, is always like is also like the same interval just depending on the sign of b this time. Uh, you can do the opposite, and now the sign is opposite of the sign of b, uh, and then the interval gets flipped. Uh, or you can do an actual round, like round to nearest integer, and then the remainder is either positive or negative, but it's like in like it's only half that, like the uh, differences are at most half. Or you can do Euclidean, and then you round depending on the sign, which means the remainder is always positive. So what does this mean? Well, in practice, there are only three algorithms that really matter. And the sad news is that every programming language picks a different one. So we've got truncation, for example, used in C++, Rust, and other systems programming languages. Flawed, which is used by Lua. And then Euclidean, which is used by Dart. Um, Flawed division is, I think, also used by Excel. And Dart, uh, Euclidean is also used like, in math in general. So it's weird. The good news is they all agree if both are positive, then it's a no-brainer. If we have a division by negative 7, um, C++ round truncates it. So 10 divided by negative 7 is negative 1. But with float division, we always round down. So 10 divided by negative 7 is something, with, um, is some negative value we, with a comma. We round that down to negative 2, which means then we need to add back uh, a negative value to get down to 10 because we went past that. Because minus 7 times negative 2 is 14, and then we have to subtract 4 to get to the remainder. And with Euclidean, we get the same behavior as in C++. If 10 is negative, well, this is what C++, it does truncation. So minus 10 divided by 7 is minus 1, and which means that minus 7, so we need to get 3 more lower, so we get minus 3 as the remainder. With floor division, 10, minus 10 divided by 7 is minus 1 something, so we round down to minus 2, uh, which means now we have to add stuff on top because we are at negative 14. So we have to add 4 to get to 10. And with Euclidean division, uh, we get the same behavior in this case. And then finally, when both are negative, um, minus 10 divided by minus 7 is a positive value because we truncated, which means the remainder is again minus 3 because the way the formula works out. Um, with float division, we've matched the behavior. And, but Euclidean, um, this time, is the odd one out. We are 2. So minus 10 divided by negative 7 is 2, which means that we have to add 4. And the beautiful thing about Euclidean division is that the remainder is always positive and always a positive value, which is a convenient property to have if you actually want to like, narrow something down to an interval using model, like in a hash table, and you're dealing with negative hash values for some reason, you have to use Euclidean division to actually get that down to the range. So this has nice properties. The floor thing, I don't know why this is useful, but it's used in practice in different program languages. And the truncation, this is just what the hardware does. So I really hate this. Table, and I just wanted to share that, like, <laughs> why do we need to think about that? Like, 
bias division of negative numbers, I think. So, anyways, um, let me get back because those were my bonus slides. So, that was my talk. Um, uh, so, I was told to say that we're hiring. So, if you promise not to use the techniques I've shown you in this talk, <laughs> you're kind of welcome to apply. Um, we are in a booth upstairs. You can win socks if you want more socks, but we can also win a free drink voucher. So, step by, spin the wheel, and win something. Uh, slides and links will be at that URL. Um, I will also tweet them out. So, thank you. <laughs>